Hi, my name's Mike Golding. I'm probably best known in sailing as uh, a short-handed sailor, sailing in the Amoka 60 fleet. Uh, I competed in four Vendée Globe races, uh, two of the challenge races with amateur crews, and I held the record for sailing single-handed, non-stop, the wrong way around the world. Uh, so in total, I think I've taken part in Ten, in nine around the world races uh, and I've completed six of them. I started to sail probably age nine uh, in the gravel pits around London uh, near Egham where Thorpe Park now is. Uh, I learned to sail, uh, I started to sail by watching my father learn to, to sail and eventually got hooked to myself. Uh, so we were sailing enterprise dinghies on a very gusty lake uh, near the motorway and um, I was very fortunate, got a lot of support from the, uh, from the instructors there who gave me free lessons in return for emptying the port loose so pretty basic background. So I think the challenge races to both of them, uh, the one in 92-93 and the one in 96-97, uh, both were unique uh, uh, opportunities. Firstly, the, the British Steel Challenge, the 92-93 race, um, it was the first time anyone had organised a race with uh, a, a varied set of amateurs. Uh, and what that means is we, our youngest crew member was 20 and our oldest was 60. Uh, some had, had very successful careers in their own rights, were experienced managers. Others were just coming into the career world and had taken the opportunity to participate in the race. So there were a lot of different motivations for participating. And as a skipper appointed to look after that, not only did you have to teach them how to sail the boat and how to live on board with each other, but you also had to provide them with a real common purpose. And that was the real skill of it. And it, uh, for me as a skipper, it gave me an enormous amount of pleasure to do those two races. Perhaps the biggest pressure that I faced uh, on board any boat was looking after an amateur crew where you realized that, you know, not everyone was as comfortable as you in some of those extreme circumstances. I always think of um, uh, one of our oldest crew members that joined us on the, on the first challenge race. Um, we arrived at Cape Horn in rather unusually 55, 60 knots of breeze uh, sailing downwind with the breeze from the east, were very, very unusual. And then we did a watch change, we jived the boat, we did a very complex jive, we did a watch change. Um, and as the watch changed, one of the, uh, Donald, one of the oldest guys on the race, um, hung back and didn't go off, uh, didn't go off down the, the uh, companionway to his cabin. And he sat down next to me on the chart table. Um, and he said, uh, Mike, uh, is this, is this normal? Is this what we're going to expect? And I said, well, I, and I'm in my early 30s, never been in the Southern Ocean before, no more than he had. So uh, I said, oh well, yeah, this is fine, Don. You know, everything's normal here. You know, <laughs> completely not knowing at all myself whether it was or it wasn't. And um, and he, he looked fine. He toddled off and went off down. I watched him go in, brush his teeth, and uh, he came out came out of the the, the um, where the, the sinks were wearing a set of pajamas and went to bed. <laughs> so you know that's a, a unique situation, but it shows you something about the confidence that you can inspire into others. And you know he and all of them, all of the challenge crew members, went on to do some extraordinary things on the boats. And uh, uh, you know I'm I'm continuously in the awe of what they achieved. The thing about sailing the wrong way around the world is 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 not so much um, uh, is the fact that it's so rarely done. It's so rarely been completed. Many people have tried it and failed to do it non-stop. Many people have tried it and done it with stops. But to do that particular turn of the world against the prevailing winds and currents is an extremely difficult thing to do without breaking. Still today. In, in the 21st century, uh, only five people have successfully 
sailed the wrong way around the world non-stop solo. It is still, even now, an extremely uh, difficult record to attain. I did the, I took part in the Vendée Globe on four separate occasions. Um, on the first one, I was dismasted after eight hours and uh, returned because of the rules of the race. I'm allowed to, I was allowed to return to Le Sable de Lon. We stepped a new mast, uh, which had to be brought from England. It was a, a, a very complex uh, logistical exercise. We cut new sails, we made new rigging, uh, we got the boat going again in, in eight days. But eight days after the race had left, uh, I restarted the race uh, in very firmly, obviously, in last place. And, um, and then spent the rest of the race catching everyone. <laughs> um, and ultimately, I finished, uh, I finished seventh in, in the uh, 2000 race. The race I really should have won was the 2004 race, uh, the next edition. Uh, in fact, uh, I didn't have a stellar start and fell, about, fell behind a bit, well, by 800 miles in the South Atlantic. Um, but I had a stunning Southern Ocean crossing. Um, and I day after day, I broke records. And I caught up. And by the Falklands, I took the lead uh, in the Vendée Globe, in 2000, 2004 Vendée Globe. And, um, and within 24 hours, a halyard failure um, put, dropped me back to third place. Uh, I repaired it, um, got the sail up again, retook the lead, and actually it happened another time. It almost sounds unbelievable, but each time I retook the lead, and then eventually I had to run a completely new system in because I had a, a fundamental problem with the main halyard system. Uh, so I had to run a complete replacement system, which took me loads of time, loads of energy. I ended up 100 and 150 miles behind, and I was wasted <laughs> by the effort of re-threading these halyards. And so as we approached uh, the finish in the Sub de uh, the three boats that were at the front of the fleet all uh, were lying abreast, almost within 20 miles of each other, as we tacked towards um, uh, towards Le Sable de Lon. But uh, Vincent Rieu, who'd uh, extended up to the north, had better, better leverage, and it was pretty clear he was going to win. But you never know. You never can tell with yacht racing. But then just to add a last bit of spice to it, as we were approaching, uh, I was 90 miles away from finishing, uh, Vincent Ryu was about to finish, Jean Le Cam was still potentially catchable, uh, but then uh, very, I was kind of thwarted by the fact my keel snapped uh, and fell off. Very suddenly I thought that there was a gust of wind and I, 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 I eased the main sheet and then because the boat wasn't recovering I eased the jib. So, I mean, very quickly I realised that, that something was wrong because the sails were basically depowered and yet the boat was still heeling over at 30 degrees. So um, I started to look and think, well, maybe we've had a hydraulic failure on the keel because it's a hydraulic canting keel. I rushed down below, I looked at the keel head. The keel head was absolutely held secure with the two rams and everything looked absolutely fine. So I went out on deck and I stuck my head over the back of the boat, looking upside down, looking forward. Um, and I saw that the keel, in fact, was still there. Uh, the only thing was, it was at 90 degrees to what I'd just seen inside the boat. Uh, so the keel had snapped, but was hanging on by the merest uh, tiny tether of ripped steel. Uh, and as I got up and went down below again to put more ballast in the boat, there was a little ting, a bit like uh, pulling the lid off a Coke can. Um, and that was the end of the keel. Three, three and a half tons of keel and bulb disappeared to the bottom. But uh, fortunately, by then, I had sufficient ballast in the boat. I depowered the sail plan, uh, and as a result, the boat stayed on its feet, and I was able to very slowly uh, take tentative steps towards... Uh, initially, I dropped all the sail, but tentatively, I started putting more sail up because even though that situation is very severe and obviously losing your kill is a very severe situation. The mentality that you've been in on a Vendée Globe is that you're 
all about getting to the mark, to the finish. Uh, and even though that serious event was happening, all that was really occurring in my mind was, okay, that's happened, so now how do I get to the finish? And, and that is the kind of mentality that drives a lot of successful Vendée Globe sailors. Uh, it's just a total conviction to get to the finish, whatever. Uh, and it was that conviction that stopped me from feeling fear or panic or any of the other more normal symptoms that that sort of thing would uh, uh, would would actually uh, uh, deliver. The other round the world races I, I I've taken part in are the around alone, but rather I've been rather less successful at the around alone. Uh, on the first edition, my first edition of the around alone in '98. Um, uh, I, uh, I hit New Zealand, or a beach off New Zealand, and was de-keeled. Uh, and uh, on the second edition, I was caused, called to go to the rescue of Alex Thompson. Um, and that happened uh, after a set of circumstances that made it really quite an ironic rescue. Uh, firstly, the two of us had fallen out as friends uh, prior to the start and we hadn't spoken to each other for the entire uh, duration of the of the race which was kind of weird because we were two very close competitors and were sailing in very close proximity to each other uh, at the time we were both pushing our boats extremely hard uh, and we were both looking like one or other of us was going to end up very shortly in the lead of the of the race. So um, when it happened, um, we were sailing at night, and uh, uh, I was watching the plot, which you get. You get a, a file in the morning which shows everyone's positions. I noticed that Alex had slowed down considerably, and just knowing the way these boats look. I knew it was wrong, so I called uh, the race headquarters. They said, no, it's no problem, not wishing to give away the fact that it was a problem. And then subsequently, uh, I was asked by Alex to go back and, uh, and rescue him because he'd had a complete keel head failure. So basically the hydraulic rams at the top of his keel that snapped the keel head off, uh, and his keel was swinging underneath the boat out of control smashing its way through the hull and the bulkheads that hold it and the boat was in in peril of sinking and certainly it wasn't a good situation we were at the time we were a thousand miles from the from the south of, uh, of south africa so we were a thousand miles south of cape town uh, and in very cold water in very hostile conditions and more importantly we were sailing on the front of a very large depression uh, a very large weather system, which we had been had been pushing us along, and now that he'd slowed down, this depression was going to go fully across him, and he was going to be in some very bad conditions. So, I had to turn around and sail back upwind. Uh, by the time I was called, I was 90 miles away, so I had to turn around and sail 90 miles back upwind, and we had to rendezvous uh, initially in the middle of the night. Uh, hoping that we could perform the, tra the transfer, get him off the boat, um, in the centre of that depression. And that was, that was the goal. In fact, the depression moved slightly slower and I got there slightly early. So we waited until early the following morning. The depression centre came across, the skies cleared, blue sky, uh, the seas settled down, they were still very lumpy. Uh, in the middle of the storm and uh, we were able to get him off but it was a very complex pickup because I had engine problems, uh, had uh, gearbox problems, I had, had several problems trying to trying to do it from Alex's perspective very scary because he had to leave his relatively safe boat get into a life raft and we had to perform uh, an exchange at sea really much more difficult than uh, it might at first appear. These things always seem like they're going to be very straightforward, but the reality of it is at any point Alex could have got hurt, injured, drowned, lost, 
there were lots of things that could have gone wrong. So I was delighted to get him on board. He was delighted to be on board. And, uh, and I can assure you, we've been the best of friends ever since.